seventh episode of the Launcher Farm Show, where I interview Valerie Garcia. Valerie and I discuss how she went from answering phones in a real estate brokerage to helping agents with their marketing, to being an educational director of over 17,000 agents, and then going on to being named one of Inman's top 100 influencers, as well as a top 20 social influencer on a Swanepoel Power 200. In this episode, Valerie and I talk about how doing what everyone else is doing can lead to your ultimate failure. Valerie shares some super helpful tips for email marketing so that you can ensure you get more of your audience reading and engaging with your marketing. We also talk about why only marketing your real estate business is actually hurting. We also share a super easy way to connect with your clients just by being more human. And we discuss how understanding Maslow's hierarchy of needs can completely change your marketing. Plus, we share a ton of other great ideas that you can implement into your business today. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Be sure to like and subscribe and enjoy the episode with Valerie. Thanks for joining us on the Launch Your Farm Show. We have a great guest. It's Valerie Garcia. You are Valerie Garcia, speaker and consultant. So Valerie, take a second. Tell us a bit about yourself and a bit about your business. Well, hey, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I've been in real estate education for 23 years now. Started out answering phones in a real estate office and um, yeah, sort of moved along to educating on a pretty large scale across the world. Um, and I just have a real passion for helping people do better marketing and talk to their people and be human and enjoy what they do. So hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit about that today. Awesome. Yeah, you got a really cool experience, and I think that really helps shape a different view from from your own experience. Instead of just just being in the trenches, you got a really unique way of seeing it and being able to observe other agents and what they're doing and kind of what has worked, what hasn't worked. And I know you do some fun videos of kind of breaking down social media and then the do's and don'ts and stuff. So you've got a really cool eye on that. So why don't we start with kind of at the beginning? You said you started in in answering phones. What did your career look like, and how did you end up where you're at now? Yeah, sure. So right out of school, I took a job answering phone front desk at a Century 21 office. Um, I was the only female in the office. It was me and 45 dudes. <laughs> and um, I got kind of a crash course in real estate really quickly. I had a great broker, learned a lot those first couple of years. But what I found was is that I had a passion for the admin and the education side of the business. I was the person that like came to and said, I don't know how to use the fax machine or the MLS. <laughs> How do I do that? And so I just found that early on, I was the one that was like, I'll figure it out and then I will teach you. Um, and that just kind of snowballed because then we got the internet and, um, and then we hit social media. And all along, I was just kind of that person that ended up figuring stuff out and teaching people how to do it. Um, that sort of translated into a position that I had in Australia several years ago where I became um, you know, operations manager for 45 offices and wow. teaching people branding and marketing and how to use social and how to blog. And that ended me up as the director of education for Remax Integra, uh, based out of Toronto for six years. Uh, had the opportunity and the pleasure of working with 17,000 agents across that territory. Um, and then four years ago, I went out of my own. So I have the opportunity to work with a ton of different brands and companies and take on all kinds of cool projects around the idea of educating and you know, using technology and marketing. Um, so just had an awesome opportunity to evolve over time and, and, uh, and help people along the way. So you've learned a few things over the years, I'm assuming then. A few. <laughs> okay. So what, one of the things I do know is that agents sometimes don't want to learn themselves and they want to just be told what to do. They want to I don't know. Well, you figured out. So that's kind of where you help fill that, that gap in the, in the market where people say, just tell me what I need to do. So for farming, let's talk about that. Cause that's obviously what the show's about in the past. Where have you seen agents go wrong when it comes to farming? Um, I think the, the number one mistake people make when it comes to farming is thinking that farming is just peppering an area with flyers yeah. and waiting. Yeah. Um, I think that's the worst approach. And I think that especially um, in areas in Ontario where I, you know, I've seen it firsthand where I've come home and there's 17 flyers stuffed in my doorknob and under my mat, yeah. you know, like people spend a ton of money on like junk content. And they think if I just, just put tons of it out there, something yeah. will happen. Um, you know, one of the things that I always tell people is, is less is more in that situation, but better is, is best. Yep. So do some good stuff. And uh, hopefully we'll talk about that today. Like what's working and what's great as opposed to just like, how about I just throw a ton of money and a ton of paper at it? Yep. 
And that's, uh, it's totally true where people think that if I just hit them with enough stuff, they're going to like it. And you said less is more. The, the right message is better. And I've always said that the, the same cost to send the right message, it's the same cost to send the wrong message. And the right message, you're going to get a different re- response. The one thing that I think is also important to note that when people hear about farms, they think postcards and they think door knocking. And then they also, the next thing they hear is that, oh, it takes six to 18 months before you start getting deals. And I think that mostly comes from that if you just pepper them with enough crap, you're going to get deals. And you, yeah, in 18 months, you may get a deal from just peppering with crap. We're going to talk about some strategies that can help speed that up, some things that work and some strategies that can sure. obviously speed that up. So in all your years, what's the worst thing you've seen someone send when it comes to farming? <laughs> God, Ryan, I don't know. Um, yeah, okay, I do know. So there is this guy. Um, I lived in Brampton for many, many, many years. And uh, say what you want about Brampton, I love it. Like that was my town. I'm a yeah. Bramptonite. Um, there is this agent there that sends these like giant flyers every week for years. And they were like the kind that would like fold out to like a poster size. Yeah. And it was just like on one side, it was just his face. Like, <laughs> And the other side is just like 60,000 tiny little pictures of houses that all said sold. Um, I got that same flyer in the mail like every week for literally, I kid you not, a decade. Yeah. And um, it, for me, like consistently, I just looked at it every week and thought there is zero value here for me, yeah. um, you know, as a buyer or a seller. And I bought and sold three times during that decade. Um, there was never anything there that said, here's some information you can use. It was all very, very self-promotional. And I always used to say like, it was a pretty easy fix. Like that flyer, open it up, circle this house and say, this is the house that sold for the most in the last 60 days. This is the one that sold for the least. And here's why, um, you know, and immediately now that becomes like this giant hodgepodge of information to some information that means something to me because immediately I want to start comparing my house to those houses and like figure out where I fall. Um, so the, even the worst stuff can be fixed. I totally agree. And that, and that ties into the next thing, which is what are some good ideas? Because agents I find get stuck, especially when it comes to farming is they don't know what to send. They don't know what to, how to provide value. And there's a ton of opportunity when you think correctly and I hate saying this, but I've heard it before that they call it agents in, do inbred marketing where they just copy what the last person did and they do the same thing over and over again without putting any thought into it and without really saying, is this actually providing value? So let's go back to what is the core of adding value do you think, do you think when it comes to, to that kind of marketing? So I'm going to start with maybe one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite books. Um, and it's a Donald Miller quote. And he says, your customer is a hitchhiker. And like when I heard this, it, it totally fundamentally changed the way that I market my own business. Um, but thinking about the fact that your client is a hitchhiker, they're standing by the side of the road, you pull up next to them, you roll your window down and your client has exactly one question. Can you help me get where I'm going? Yeah. Right. Like that's it. That's the one yeah. thing your customer cares about. And yet we pull up in our car, we roll down our window and we're like, Hey, check out my car. I built it with my own (laughs) bare hands. Look at my playlist. It's amazing. Look how good I look in this car. Like, have you checked me out? And your customer doesn't care. Like they literally just want to know, can you help me get where I'm going? And so if we fundamentally think about marketing that way, like to, to provide value, we have to first figure out like, where's our customer going? And what do they need to get there? Um, and so, so few people, when they start farming, actually think about who is my audience? Like, yeah. they, they think a little bit like, okay, maybe like they're older folks in this established neighborhood and maybe they're going to be downsizing yeah. or maybe they're young families, but they don't really think about like, what are the struggles or the challenges or the things that these people, um, you know, really need solved for them? Because if you can pinpoint where your customer is going, where the hitchhiker is heading, yeah. everything you do can help them get where they want to go. And that's value. Yeah. So yeah. that's totally true. And I, I've always said that like every pain point, whether it's real estate or not, is a way to add value. And when you can start adding that value and you can stack that value on top of it, then they're going to start seeing you as the person they want to work with, not just the face that they saw and not just yeah. the, the cheesy ad that they saw. Yeah. So totally. one of the things that I've, I've seen is that again, agents will repeat what they do and then they, they see other agents do what they think is effective farming. They see the people doing the same postcards, the same things over and over again. And I had a 
an aha years ago where I realized I was reading a book on marketing and they said, people think that all marketing works and they think if they see it enough that it works. It's like most advertising campaigns don't actually work. And a lot of ad companies just kind of keep going until they find that hit that works for them. Okay. The mistake that I find a lot of agents make is they'll see what other people do and go, well, if that person's doing it, it's got to be working. If it's working for them, what can agents do to like avoid that to say, okay, I'm going to provide value. Forget what anyone else is doing. Like how can they start going? How do I, how do I up my game? Well, it's kind of the scariest answer that you could possibly imagine, but the answer is be different. Like do yeah. what nobody else is doing. Um, you know, the best companies in the world have capitalized on the idea of doing what their competition can't or yeah. won't do. And I think, you know, that's really scary because what's easy is what you're talking about is agents going, I saw somebody do that. I'm going to rip it off. I'm going to do it because if they're doing it, it must work and I'm going to do it and it's comfortable and it's good. But the reality is, is if everybody's doing it, it's like, you know, all those posts on social media when the time changes, like (laughs) a thousand posts with the same clock, you know, like, but what's different stands out. Like what is, what is weird, what is unique is really what people pay attention to. And so the question I would say to people is how can you do what other people are doing in a totally new and interesting way. Yeah. Like how can you deliver the same type of experience, but totally differently um, and, and get them to feel something like, wow, or I've never seen that before, or that's interesting, or that's kind of crazy. Um, that's the kind of reaction that you want to go for. That's what's memorable. That's what's remarkable. Um, and so, you know, let's, let's talk about postcards for a second. Sure. I love postcards. I'm a huge fan of postcards. Like postcards can be super fun. Postcards can also also be super boring, right? Like he can be like, again, here's a whole bunch of houses that are already sold. Call me. Yeah. Who cares? You know, like people aren't reading that crap. But you could go so far to the other side, which is like, here's a postcard with a cookie recipe. Like, I'm sorry, but none of us are like sitting around in our 1950s aprons anymore like oh please send me a casserole recipe yeah we gotta find a a balance so i was working with a client a couple of months ago and i was like they were like i need to send a postcard out what is going to get people's attention and i said to them how do you feel about llamas and they sort of had this like what and i'm like you know llamas are kind of that animal that like everyone thinks they're really fun yeah. Like they're kind of cool. Like a llama smiling into the camera in a close range is always an attention getter. Yeah. And I was like, you know, why don't we do a funny animal series? Like instead of sending the same stodgy old, like, Hey, I'm number one, call me, you and a picket fence sort of yeah. thing. Like let's send some funny stuff, like some stuff that's interesting and cute that people would hang on their fridge or show their kids, yeah. you know? Um, and it worked. Like, we sent some, we sent, you know, some really funky stuff. We sent like a picture of a snowman whose nose had been eaten by a a rabbit and we sent llamas and we sent dogs that had, you know, like their hair and pigtails. And people are listening to this and they're thinking like, that sounds ridiculous and childish. (laughs) But the reality is, is that people didn't throw them away. They showed them to their families. They were like, look at this funny picture, you know, like showed them to their kids, hung them on the fridge. Their kid was like, can I have that? Yeah. They stuck around. Yeah. Um, They had a shelf life. Right. And so thinking about like, what is eye catching? What is interesting? What is funny without being offensively funny? Yes. What is something that will make people smile? Uh, That's the stuff that's working for postcards right now. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are afraid to take that jump, like you said, because they're afraid of it, A, not working. They're afraid of B, they're afraid that people are going to think that they look silly. And in reality, it, most people have, a not, well, there are some people who don't have a good sense of humor, but they're, mo- the average person has a decent sense of humor and can see the humor in it and want to know that you're a real person and want to know that you have a sense of humor. And I think our industry as a whole, a lot of people are caught up in that we have to be this stuffy real estate agent that fits this, what we, in a box of what we think of in a business suit with your cell phone, driving a Mercedes and and not as a real person. And that's where your marketing can really help start branding you as a person, as a real human being. My very first episode was with Chuck Charlton and he showed some of his signs of he's done back to the future. Some funny things he's had, he's, I know he's had, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, 
hello, is it me you're looking for? What's his name? Oh, Lionel Richie. Lionel Richie on his signs. And he's allowed his personality to come through and people then connect with him. And he's not going to connect with everybody, but the people that do really resonate with him. And when you create content that's funny and, and can be more memorable, you create a better experience for people. And you have to be okay with knowing you're not going to hit everybody and you're not going to get everybody. Right. And that's, right. that's okay. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, doing stuff that's family oriented, yeah. you know, like coloring book pages and things like that. You're not always going to hit the mark. There are going to be people that are like, I don't have kids. That's yeah. not my thing. You know, you may do something animal related and some people are like, I'm not a dog person. Yeah. But the reality is, is that you are like the people that you do touch are going to be even more in like in. Yeah. They're going to be like, that's super cool. Like that. I'm all about that. Yeah. Um, so taking risks, being a little bit weird, I think is definitely key. I think the zig when everyone's zagging is another thing. Like when the internet first came out with real estate, the, the pioneers who were using it were ahead of everybody and they were zagging when everyone was zigging. And then everyone and their brother jumped on board and then all doing the same things, all repeating the same messages that's when you have to go the other way. And for myself, when I started my first farm, we went polar opposite. We actually went hard copy. We were sending reports and we were doing, we did a, a binder and we would bring a report every month. Instead of, I could easily just click an email and send them the information, but we did a hard copy. We had a nice cover to it and they actually kept the binder and they put stuff in the binder and each month they would, they would build on it. And yeah. we went to listing appointments and they would actually show up and they'd have the binder with them and they'd hold on to it and, or we'd see it in their shelf and, everyone else wanted to go digital and they were shocked when we'd say, Oh, we actually send you a hard copy. And they're like, Oh wow. So it's, yeah, you, you got to go in a different direction sometimes. Yeah. And, and that really helps stand out. So totally. other than funny stuff with postcards, do you have anything else that you think would be a good fit for people to do? Yeah. I mean, I think the most popular thing that I've heard that has gotten the best results um, is the unsolicited CMA. Yeah. Um, you know, so, Hey, whether or not you're thinking about selling, Yep. This is, this is where your house is right now. This is where your value sits. This is, you know, what you would be competing against if you were to sell today. This is the last three solds, you know, that would be a comp. And that is, you know, that's highly impressive. Yep. And that's the kind of stuff people want to know. And they don't want to beg for it. And they don't want to fill out a form for it. And they don't want to necessarily have, have you come sit in their living room for it. Yep. They want to see it before they make a decision. And, you know, I mean, people bag on Zestimates and all of those sorts of, you know, auto vowels, but like, if you can give them some real information that is valuable to them, yeah. um, you know, I, I've talked to a number of agents who are selling a ton of real estate and they're selling, you know, 50 to a hundred houses a year. And the majority of their business is coming from CMAs, wow. CMAs that they're sending their past clients and CMAs that they're sending their farm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're not talking like these don't have to be huge, long, detailed things. It can be three things, you know, like here's the value. Here are the top three competitors if you were to list right now. And here are the last three comps. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that is super valuable for people that are like, you know what, maybe it's time. Yeah. Or maybe it's not time, but this really helps me to understand where I would be. Yeah. Um, so don't like, don't discount the value of, of giving information rather than holding it back. I just recently recorded an episode with Addo from Major Locator. And he said, we were talking about that and, and saying that the people want that information. And if you don't give it to them, someone will give it to them. Yeah. And a lot of agents are afraid of, if I give that to them, they're going to take it and go somewhere else. They were going to do that anyways. So whether you gave them information, they were going to go work with their cousin and they were going to go do for sale by owner or whatever. The business you gain will far outweigh the business you're going to lose because you gave some people that information, yeah. in, in my opinion. But yeah. when you're there and you're helpful and they want that information, they're going to want to work with you. Yeah. And, and like the crazy numbers that we still see out of the National Association of Realtors tell us like 60 some percent of people work with the very first agent they ever talk to. Yep. Yeah. And so if you are the very first agent that's given them some really good information and they actually even digitally strike up a conversation, like yeah. you are, you are twice as likely to get that business as anybody else. And so, 
yeah, I think there's real value in just giving more than what was expected or asked for. And when you position that information in a different way too, instead of just the sale price, you can give the sale price, but like you said, here's how this one sold, why it sold for top dollars and why it sold for less. It starts positioning you as an expert. It starts positioning you as I know the area. I know why Chuck does with his, he does the Milton daily homes and he talks about why the homes are selling and why these are good buys. And and that provides another step instead of just looking at data. And again, it it positions you as the expert. At the end of the day, that's what you want in, in the farm specifically. They want to know, that the person they're hiring knows the area, knows what they're talking about and yeah. can do the job. Yeah. So online, email's a big thing. A lot, yeah. again, zigging and zagging. People said yeah. that email's dying, it doesn't work. Yeah. Email works when it's done right. So can right. you share some strategies that are working and that, that agents can actually start implementing? Yeah, email is actually kind of hot again. Like, you know, it's interesting. Years ago, you would go into a store and they'd have a clipboard that said, give us your email address and we'll add you to our mailing list. And we did because it was cool to get email because back then we didn't get any. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the, the whole movie, You've Got Mail came out. Like it was actually kind of sexy to get mail at one point. And then we just got a lot of mail. And so it just sort of became a chore. Yeah. But we can still give people that feeling of joy of like, oh my gosh, I got something cool. But we have to put the work in. Yeah. Like 86% of business professionals say they prefer email and 73% of millennials still prefer email, which is, I mean, that's crazy. So when you look at email, there's a huge opportunity there if you're doing it right. If you're spamming, forget it, right? Like if you're spamming, you're just going to go into the pile of crap with everybody else. But if you take the time to send something that's a little bit different and a little bit interesting and maybe a little bit fun. Yep. Um, you're, you know, you're going to get results. Now there's also some like technical stuff you should know about email these days. So there are certain words that you use in your subject lines that will automatically just get you basically caught in the algorithm of the, you know, never, never land. Like yep. you're going to go into the black hole of promotions yep. folder. Um, so some of the things you don't want to use in your subject lines anymore are free. Okay. Free is a big yep. no, no. Um, offer definitely puts you in spam. So, yep. you know, even if you're just like, Hey, you have an offer or right. would you like multiple offers? Right. Gonski. Um, now is another word that puts you into no. sort of that, like thou shalt not be read folder. Yeah. Um, for sale, definitely a big one. Okay. And recently even Gmail has started sort of, um, burying stuff that have brackets. So a lot of people like it was cool for a while to put brackets around the word video. Um, So now they're starting to suppress that as Mm. well. Um, So knowing some of those things, some of those words will really help you make sure that you don't, first of all, end up in spam. Because once you end up in spam once, you're basically screwed because it's very hard to get out of there. So some of the things you do want to do, some of the things that are working right now are, and I cringe to say this, Ryan, because you know me, (laughs) emojis. Yeah. Emojis are a thing right now in subject lines. They're working. Um, so I wouldn't go overboard and put like 27 emojis <laughs> in there, but they're, you know, they're, they're working, um, stuff that's really short and sweet. So the fewer words, the better, and then stuff that's intriguing. And the difference between intriguing and clickbait is intriguing is, Hey, this will help you. And you think how yeah. not, Hey, you'll never guess what Margaret, Megan Markle looks like now. Right. right? Like there's a line. So yeah. Like make sure that it's something that people are like, oh, that's interesting. So some of those things are really super important um, in terms of like getting your stuff just opened in the first place Um, and, you know, making sure that you don't end up in spam. But And especially, like you said, on the flip side, if you end up in the junk mail, it's hard to get out. If you get into their inbox, once you make it there, you then have a higher chance of staying there. So it's make sure you're crafting the right message up front and don't just send anything for the sake of it. Cause if you end on this side of the fence, you want to stay there and not on this. That's side. right. Once they're in your email though, um, one of the things that actually lends you credibility to your email list are links. So if you have links in your email and people click on them, yep. the algorithm sees that as, Oh, you have a genuine email that people are interested in and they clicked right. on a link. And so you're more likely now to stay in people's inboxes. So including links like read more, go here, you know, check out this video in the actual body of your email. Yeah. It's going to allow people to say, I want to know more, click through, and that lends credibility to your email. So just a couple things, like not to game the system, but to understand 
like everything's controlled by algorithms these days. So you kind of have to know how to work it. So, so that, can, I, can I ask you about that then? Because I know yeah. years ago, they were kind of shunning photo based. Uh, everyone's doing like e-newsletters with photos and stuff like that. And then yeah. I know it started coming back a little bit more. Is that still looked down upon if you have like image based emails or is it text or is it a balance or what, what do you find? Yeah. I mean, it's super like what's most important these days is that it's, it's something that looks good on a mobile device because right. most people these days are going to open their email on their phone first. Yep. They may then go to a secondary device, bigger screen, but for the most part, people are gonna open it on a mobile device. So if you're putting everything in like a giant photo and that photo doesn't load or you have to scroll over or you have to yep. pinch or zoom, forget it. Yep. So I, I don't discourage images. I think images are great, but also make sure that whatever you're doing, you test it first on a yes. mobile device and look at what it looks like. Because yep. if I can read it really clearly, um, you know, that's great. One of the things, like when I first started sending out my monthly love letter, um, one of the things I learned is that my text was too small. Right. Like people were looking at it and on a, on a, like a larger screen, like a laptop, it looked great. Yep. But when you're opening it on even a, a phone that's yep. larger, you know, people were having to sort of like, it, it was just kind of a pain. And yep. so I needed to increase my font size, but it, you know, I didn't know that until I was testing it and other people were giving me that feedback. So super important that you send it to yourself first and open it on multiple devices and look at what it looks like. And like you said, going back and knowing your audience, if your audience is 70 year olds, you have to make it not just regular size, you have to make it large size. I know my uncle has his phone setting set up and it's like one word per screen That's almost. Right. So if, yeah, if, if you know your audience and yeah. there, you want to make sure it's visually appealing to them and, and it makes sense for them yeah. to read it. Yeah. Uh, so I want to talk about then is how often, because I know for your newsletter, you send it once a month and it's more, it's heavy on being quality and not just sending stuff out. So you take okay. the time to really, to, to build that. If someone's sending stuff, do you suggest doing a once a month? Do you send stuff weekly? What, like, what's, what do you think works? I think what works is whatever you set the expectation to be. Okay. You know, if you, when you go to my website and you sign up, if it says sign up for regular updates, or if it says sign up for a weekly drip or, um, you know, a daily post or whatever, yeah. whatever your expectation is, deliver that. Okay. You know, when you sign up for my newsletter, it says you're signing up for my monthly newsletter and occasionally I will send you cool stuff. Yep. But that means I have a responsibility not to like turn occasionally into I'm going to drip stuff on you every day. You yeah. know, like, no. Um, so, you know, like every once in a great while, you might get something extra from me. But for the most part, you're going to hear from me once a month. So set the expectations and then be consistent, whatever that is. Like I know people that do a really great daily blog really consistently and God bless them because I could not do that. Yep. Like good for them. But that's a lot of like, that's a commitment, right? Because now you know, you've got to stick to it. So I don't know that if you set expectations and people opt in, I don't know that anything is too much. Um, is that if that's what you've signed up for, yep. right? Perfect. And I think that you said the consistency is key. I uh, recently interviewed Matt Santa Capita and he does a Monday market update and he does it every Monday. And he said, yeah. doesn't matter if it's a long weekend, if it's not, and he's at like 120 something of those he's in and said, we just keep putting them out and everyone knows Mondays, Monday, 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 Monday. So consistency is more important than, I don't know, quality is important consistency quality, with quality consistency, kind of go more together. Than quantity. Yeah. I think, yeah, again, I think it's just whatever you set that expect expectation for, yeah. you know, like I, I get a daily email. Like I have some emails that I've subscribed to that are daily Yeah, and I love them, but I also know what I'm in for, right. right? Like I get one every single day and it is the first thing that I look at when I wake up, open my eyes, put my glasses on, grab my phone. And that is where I go. Yeah, it, It's that good. Yeah. But you know, like there are some that if I got them every day, I would be like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, so yeah. So then, as far as co content goes for farming, yeah, what kind of things do you think would be a good fit? Because again, I, I see a lot of agents get hung up on the what do I send? I I did a yeah. survey before I started any of this, and I you know, surveyed three hundred plus agents, and the three things that came up was 
consistency that they had struggles with. They had struggles with starting the farm and actually picking it. And the third thing was, what do I actually send? So can you give some tips on what do I, what do I send? Yeah. So I think um, non-real estate stuff is great. And I think that we don't see enough of that. Yep. Um, so, you know, I would love to get stuff like um, best place to go see fireworks yep. Canada day. I would like to see, you know, uh, best walking trails, where to go and get your, um, you know, like where along the bike path are those like bike service centers where you can like pump your tires or yeah. whatever, or like where are good um, places to go within an hour of the city that I can take my kids and socially distance and, yeah. you know, walk with my pets. Um, where are the three best places to get ice cream? It's summertime, you know, like yeah. where can I go and swim outdoors without driving an hour and without it being crowded? Yeah. Um, what are some of the best things to plant right now, this time of year for, for where I live? Um, you know, like when you think about it that way, their options are endless. And I think so many times we get tied to this idea that it has to be real estate related. Um, and that's boring. Like, yeah. honestly, like if my dentist sent out something like every single month on like how to take care of your teeth, I'd be <laughs> over it. Um, but what I love is just like stuff that's real and human. Yeah. Um, so look for those things, you know, like, Look for those things that you would want to know. Um, some of those things, you know, may come naturally to you. Some of them you may have to like go in and just sort of like start to Google yeah. what are people Googling around me, um, you know, but there are so many resources that are going to allow you to take that stuff and repurpose it. So like subscribe to your school newsletters for your local schools, yeah. um, you know, your community center, your local library sends yeah. out a newsletter, probably an e-newsletter. Um, your uh, look for places in the in the city that cater to professionals like you do. Yep. So again, mortgage reps and co-working spaces and professional um, groups like the Rotary Club, yep. and then use some of that stuff and repurpose it. Yep. Um, but take the pressure off doing all real estate all the time. You know, like I can put up with like about this much of rates. Yeah. and what's happening in the market but I could read all kinds of stuff about walking trails and getting outside and restaurants and the best burger in town and people um, I know somebody who does a really great series every single time they reach out every month they tell the story of one of the streets in town and what it was named for or who oh, that's cool for. That's um, yeah. and that's really cool like if you live in a town that has a historic district yeah. like you know, tell the story of a building or a yeah. street or, you know, like, why is Brown Street named Brown Street? Like, yeah. that's the kind of stuff people are like, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's you cool. Know? I like that. I mentioned Matt earlier and uh, he was talking about, because he does a lot with businesses and stuff, and he was talking about how important it is to have your database segmented and having good that's tags so on it. Important. And he was talking about, it was such a smart idea to say, when you have it tagged right, you can then say, okay, who are the fathers? So on Father's Day, I can send them. Who has kids? I can send them the five best splash pads this summer. Who is a beer drinker? Here's a new brewery that just opened up. And then you can really start tailoring your content to, to the audience. And you're not, then it won't be spam. So if someone yeah. likes beer, they're going to like the beer thing. And if they don't like beer, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I think another thing for me that's always been something I've liked to do is I don't have to create the content if I can get other professionals to create it for me. And that's where I think having your sphere come in and having the, the professionals in the, in the farm, in the area. So if you've got, like you mentioned, your, your preferred vendors, if you're a home inspector, but outside of real estate, the mom and pop shops and have them create stuff because they want to know that they're going to be advertised. And, and when you can share their information, you don't have to create it. You just have to manage it and kind of herd that yeah. they're get, providing the content to you, but yeah. you don't have to, you could literally do an awesome newsletter and not, write a lick of content and provide value to people. Yeah. There's an agent in my town and I recently relocated. So like my town is new to me again. I've lived, I lived here 20 years ago, but yeah. you know, it's like a whole new world. And I follow a couple of real estate agents who do this really well. And on social, there's one that every single week they feature a new neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and they talk about like why you would want to hang out in that neighborhood. Like where would you go? And like, where would you get a coffee? And, it's so cool because now like I wait for that. And then that week I go to that neighborhood. And yeah. um, so last week they were talking about 
um, the Crested neighborhood. And it's kind of an, it's an up and coming area. Like it's not a super like sexy area that people go and brunch. <laughs> There's a place there called Mr. Frosty okay. and it has like the best ice cream in the city. And they have this soft serve lemon ice cream. And so you get it in a cone and then they roll it in, um, what's that cereal? Uh, fruity pebbles. Oh, nice. So like, it's like this super sugary thing. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, I'm going there this week. And yeah. I did. And it was amazing. But like that, I, I love following that agent now yeah. and I'm not in the market. You know, I, I have an agent, yeah. but I remember them and I look for their stuff now because I'm like, they're, they've got those sort of like cool little neighborhood feels stuff. And yeah. uh, don't underestimate that stuff, the value of it. Exactly. And I think looking for opportunities where something, what would you like to see? Like, what would you, what would you want to get and then create that for myself? When I moved, I've moved three times in my career and I started fresh. I was in Durham region and I didn't know anyone except for the girl I was dating. I moved for a girl and uh, I was like, okay, what is there to do here? I was like trying to think about dates and things like that. What can I do? And then I started realizing there's not a lot of information. Like, like, what can I go do? And I'm like, it's a big place. There's, there's, there's gotta be stuff to do. So I realized I'm like, I'm going to create a one-stop shop for like things to do. So I created a blog. It was 52 things to do in Durham region. So I was like, okay, for the next year, I'm going to showcase and highlight it. So I started that after about, two months or a month and a half, people started coming to me. Businesses were coming to me. They were giving stuff away. They were giving, I was giving away tickets to concerts and I was giving, uh, I had a, uh, a play that's a theater company. They gave us like a, a limousine, champagne, dinner theater tickets. And I was able to now provide content and, and value to my audience. And I, all I had to do was just showcase stuff that I enjoyed. And then I got the perks of it because I got free stuff and I got to go to places and get, so yeah, it doesn't have to be real estate and people will appreciate that more than just boring real estate stats. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, and it's fun. Like you get yeah. to be a human being yep. and you're not sitting there like racking your brain for what am I going to talk about? That's real estate related today. Yep. And you know, I'm not saying don't ever talk about what you do for a living, but you know, don't talk about what you do for a living only, Yeah. you know, like nobody cares that much <laughs> to hear it all the time. But if you are a normal human being that has other interests, let those shine. Yeah. Right. I, I know great agents who talk about um, restoring vintage cars and that's not something I'm ever going to do, but yeah. it's super awesome to see them talk about it with such passion and, yeah. you know, their quests on the weekends to go and find this certain headlight. And I'm always like, it's interesting. You know, it's yeah. interesting when other people are interested in stuff. It's interesting. So be interested in stuff. And I think a cool idea that just popped in my head too, is you mentioned the hitchhiker. People want to be recognized as well. And people want to know that you're paying attention. So you could do a what's going on in your community and what are some interesting things? Is there a kid that won an award? Is there a parent who got some volunteer thing? Did there's a new thing that opened up and really showcase not just the businesses, but the people in there. And I think the people. they're going to appreciate that. Or you could do a, what's your favorite thing to do and do a quiz and then showcase, Hey, the number one thing was this. And people like to be engaged and, and create conversation back the other way, instead of just pushing messages out at them they want to be able to yeah. connect and, and know that there's a way to a dialogue so you mentioned I mean, social media it, oh, sorry. as people are listening to us talk about this you know i know a lot of people are thinking oh my gosh that sounds like a lot of work and <laughs> the reality is it is you know yeah. like it is work yep. it's not like you started out by saying you know a lot of people are just like tell me what to do yeah. like tell me the reality is, is there's one step before that. A lot of people are like, can you do it for me? <laughs> yes. And then the next step is just tell me what to do. Yeah. The reality is, is if you really want to build a following and you want to create marketing that works and you want to farm an area that's going to be loyal to you, yep. it's work. Yep. It's work. Um, it's consistent work over a long period of time. Yep. Um, you know, and we'll talk about social, but like whether you send postcards or you send emails or you show up and door knock, at some point, not right now. Um, it's work. Yeah. And that's the whole analogy of a farm is you planting your seed, you're tilling it, you're yeah. taking care of it, and then it pays off. The great thing is, and in, if anyone's taking the course that I created, it I talk about that moving from a farming model to an orchard model. And mm -hmm. basically a lot of people farm and they have to retail their farm every year. It's when you create systems that then start feeding itself. And then I use the analogy of an orchard, 
it takes a while for an apple tree to grow, but once that apple tree is grown, you just have to take care of it and trim it. And then it just gives you fruit over and over again. And, and that's my analogy with farming is you want to build these systems in place that will help you it takes time, but they'll then start feeding itself. And then the business starts coming in. It's a lot of work up front, but in the long run, it just, it's a yeah. self-sufficient yeah. system that just keeps growing, giving your business as long as you tend to it. It's such a good analogy, Ryan. And the reality is, is that anyone who has farmed or knows farmers knows that like farming's probably not a really good analogy for real estate <laughs> because I mean, like my family's farmer. So I grew up a farm, farm kid, you know, yeah. like I did hay and whatever in the summers, but like the reality is, is like farmers know that you can't grow the same crop year after year after yeah. year in the same field, you know, like one year you have to grow beans because yeah. if you grow corn every year, it strips the soil of all of the nutrients and stuff doesn't grow. Yeah. So you got to start completely over and do a whole new crop. And you, that's not the goal in real estate is yeah. you don't want to get to the point where you have to start from scratch because you did something for two years and it didn't work and you didn't track it or you weren't consistent. So you got to scratch it. Um, you know, you, your analogy is so much better. Like you need to build something that can start to like grow on itself. Yeah. Um, so true. And that, I've seen that as one of the biggest failures for a lot of agents who do farming is the ones who do stick it out will then go, okay, this is what I did. It worked. And then they just ride on the coattails of that without evolving and growing with it. And then you see it where they, they have market share and then they just kind of coast and then it just starts di disappearing. And then it's a lot, in my opinion, once you've lost that trust from people, it's harder to come back because they, the ones who do know you, it's like, well, what happened to you? You disappeared. You're, you, you, and they kind of lose faith on you. So I'd rather have someone who just slowly, silently plugging away at things versus the person who comes out, out of the gate and then yeah. this, this becomes not involved or not engaged and doesn't but, care. Like, don't, like, I don't want people to be discouraged from trying new things. Yes, for sure. Um, but like I always say, fail faster and less expensively. Yeah. Like <laughs> make your mistakes more quickly yeah. and cheaper yeah. and make more of them because eventually then you will find what works. You know, what I think a lot of people do in real estate is they go all in and they drop a ton of money and they don't know if it's going to work. Yep. Um, you know, and they do this in video where they go and buy a ton of expensive equipment, you know, and they do this in farming where they order 10,000 of something, yep. um, you know, so fail faster and less expensively, I think is a really good goal. And I, I, preach in my in my course too i talk about uh strategy stacking and it's layering those strategies together that will then complement each other so you're you're overlapping so you can do a newsletter but do a newsletter but you can also interview businesses well then those two can go together where you can now highlight those businesses in your newsletter you can do video and you can use video to interview the businesses in your newsletter and then you can use social to advertise and where it all kind of works together and so when you start when agents start seeing it, it's like, okay, it's going to be more work, but then it works together and there's less work in the long run because it kind of, your systems work together. And when but you also do, think about how you can break stuff up into smaller pieces, yeah. you know, like create one thing and yeah. then break it up into six things. Yeah. So that one blog post could be a short video, could be a Facebook post, could be a checklist, could be a top 10 list on your, um, you know, on your flyers that go out, but like, break it up and use the same thing, but in different ways so that you're not constantly reinventing the wheel. Um, people that struggle with social, I think for the most part, have a hard time figuring out how to say things in really short ways. Yes. <laughs> so take this one piece of cake and break it up into lots of pieces of cake. Yeah. Right. And now everybody gets a little bit of a piece of cake and they want more. Yeah. Um, as opposed to just like trying to figure out how to shove the whole cake at somebody. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's a ridiculous way to do business. And I don't know why some people feel like, um, you know, it's just got to be all or nothing. Yeah. Little, small, bite-sized pieces. It's all anyone consumes anyway. You know, we're all just scrolling constantly. So a little bit on Instagram, a little bit on Facebook, a yeah. little bit on your blog. And don't feel like it's all got to be somewhere. Yeah, that's great. And when an agent does that, then they can know I can chop this up, use it, try it, see what works. And then by doing that, then you can test, you can test quick and test in effect, uh, inexpensively. Yeah. You could try it and go, okay, Hey, Instagram's not working for me or Facebook's not working for me this, but Hey, YouTube really took off or what or my newsletter really took off. And when you chop it up into little pieces, you can then test it a lot more. Yep. So social is a big part of it. Where do you see agents making mistakes in social and where is the opportunities for them? 
Um, I think people spend a lot of time on social being social, <laughs> just fine. But it's not, you know, it's, you need to figure out, like, if you're actually going to create stuff that's going to generate business, you need to put some work into that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's fine to be sharing the, the crazy stuff and the, you know, like, the, the weird and the, you know, fun and the whatever. But if you are purposely building relationships on social for business, yeah. You have to sometimes look at the content that you're creating and apply the same principles that we've been talking about. You know, it can't be all about you. It can't be fluff. It's got to provide some value. It's got to be interesting. It's got to be something that people are going to pay attention to. Um, and I think there's a, you have to find the balance, you know, like I'm, I'm very social on social. I share crazy stories about my grandmother. You know, if you follow me, you know, my grams is crazy. It's great. But when it comes down to, this is what I do. Yeah. And this is how I can help you. You know, there has to be that consistency of tone and that, that value behind it and that uh, professionalism and not professionalism like, well, let me put on a suit and tie, but professionalism like I know what I'm talking about. And I think sometimes those lines can become a little blurry and yeah. people just forget that they need to cross both of those boxes yeah. off. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, yeah, but, it, uh, definitely. I think part of that comes down to also planning. I interviewed yeah. Jenny Wolock and she was talking about having a plan and she said, we plan for the year for most of our stuff and go, okay, what things are going to come out? What events are happening? What holidays are happening? And then go, okay, now we've got a plan. We don't have to worry about it. You think ahead. It takes, she said it takes a bit at the beginning of the year, but then now you can know, okay, I, I'm covered for December. I'm covered for January. I'm covered for March. We, we know what we're going to do. And then you can tweak it but you don't have to just fly by the seat of your pants and then right. throw out something and go, Oh crap. I hope it works. Right. When you, when you plan it, you've got right. time to lay it out. And Planning is brilliant. And then the ability to allow yourself to be nimble yes. to change if you need to, you yep. know, like say, I don't know if the whole world stops for a pandemic yeah. and you need to sort of switch gears a little bit. Yes. So instead of it's all like, Hey, here's where to go and have birthday parties. Instead it's, you know, like, what are some of the things you can do in your own backyard? Yep. You know, allow yourself to pivot, but planning is critical. Like, but just even if it's planning to the, to the point of who is my audience, yep. what do they need yep. and what can I provide? You know, even if you just did that little bit of planning, yep. so many people would have more success on social. Yeah. And listen, when you, when you have that plan, you feel confident behind it because you know, you've got the plan, you know, you don't have to second guess yourself and think about it. And right. you're not just going, Oh crap, I forgot something. I should just, oh, I'll send that and right. you can actually get something done. Right. So what do you find is working now, now that COVID's happened and, and people are had it having, hopefully having to shift their gears with what they're sending, what's been working for agents, do you think? Well, interestingly, I would say that what's been working is being more human. Yeah. A lot of people, <clears throat> you know, have had some pretty serious disruptions in their life, whether it was, you know, what do I do with my kids? Um, am I going to have a job? Am I going to be able to pay the mortgage or the rent? Um, am I going to be able to sustain my investments if my renters don't pay their rent? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people have had some pretty significant concerns. And I think what's working is people approaching um, these topics with honesty and humanity, yeah. um, not any sort of sensationalism. You know, I think really early on, I did a what not to do on social media webinar in March of like, okay, people pull us, pull back on the memes. Yeah. Like stop with all of like, this is hilarious. Would you like to find a home to quarantine in? Like pull back on that. Yeah. And really look at the fact that in a crisis, you know, we, if anyone's ever studied psychology even a little you know maslow's hierarchy of needs it's a triangle right yep. the very base is like what you need to survive F food water and shelter yeah the next level up is you know like gets a little more complex and it goes all the way up to the very top level which is like self-actualization like yep. meeting my goals and feeling good about myself but in a crisis you know in the middle of chaos um shrink down to that very bottom level yep. we figure out what do we need not what do we want what do we yep. need and we're not out of that cycle completely yet. I think a lot of people would like to really sort of fast track into the, what do you want? Which is like, would you love a great house with a pool? But we're still kind of in, how can we safely show you homes? Yeah. How can we safely help you move? 
And so I think when, when all else fails, when things are uncertain, shrink it down to what people need and really come at it from this, from the position of let's be human for a minute and let me empathize and understand what you need. Um, needs Trump wants yeah. every day of the week. And especially now, because we don't know your audience of who's in that scenario. We don't know just by an email or just by a social post of, is this person about to lose their house? We don't know. Is this person totally secure and fine? Is this person, is their grandma sick? And so you have to tr not tread lightly in that. Don't share good information, but it's like, we don't know where our audience is at. And, and we want to come back to that basic thing. Are you okay? Do you need help? Can we help you? And, and start yeah. working your way up. I find the advice I ever got about social media is post like you're talking to your friends. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, the reality is, is that you are. So yeah. talk like you're talking to your friends. And if you follow that sort of golden rule of social, it's hard to go wrong. Yeah. I, I've been seeing a lot of people really changing their views on community as well over this whole time. And I think a lot more people are, are open to that idea of what community really means to them now. And in the past, people would show up, go to their house, close the door. People are still in lockdown and people are still quarantining. But I think the, the opportunity in the future is going to be huge on providing a great community because people are really self figuring what does that mean? We talked about being, people in Toronto are going, do I really need to be here? And can we move somewhere else? Can I live somewhere else? And people are really reevaluating what that means to be in a community. So I think being a community ambassador is going to be huge and a huge opportunity for people and providing support to local businesses, especially those mom and pop shops where people are now going, Hey, I may not support the, the faceless chain and maybe I'd like to support those mom and pop shops. So I think there's an opportunity for agents to really say, I can give back to the community. I can help. And that this is our time to really do that because we're the connection between that sometimes for a lot of people. And there's a tremendous opportunity. Totally agree with that. Yeah. So if we're going we're gonna to wrap up, because I want, want to get on with your day. Um, if you could give one piece of advice that someone was getting started with a farm and they were trying to put together some, the right kind of message, what would one piece of advice that you'd give to say, here's where I'd start? Oof, one piece of advice. Okay. I mean, if you're just getting started, I would do the very best I could to start to identify the types of um, homeowners that live in that area, the types of residents, <clears throat> not necessarily just homeowners, you know, but the type of people that live there and what some of their, you know, where do they want to go? If they're, the, if they're your hitchhikers, where yeah. do they want to go and what are they going to need from you to get there? Um, I think that's probably my best piece of advice. It's not an easy question. It's yeah. not like, Hey, there's a sign somewhere that everybody <laughs> takes that you can sort of see, but yeah. put that, put that legwork in. And then, you know, I will, I will echo the advice that you um, got from a previous guest, which was segment your database. Yeah. If you're just starting, start segmenting now because it gets yeah. a lot harder once you've got thousands of people in there. Yeah. But segment and, and segment smart and create as many buckets as you can because that will help you down the road. And I think don't be afraid to fail on the segmenting as well because you're going to yeah. start and you're going to think these are the 10 categories in need or the 20. And then all of a sudden you're like, ah, that one doesn't work. So yeah. But starting is the most important part. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, try to go in after. Well. Like, don't be afraid to like be a little unusual in your, in your buckets. Like, yeah. um, pets, you know, like I have a cat and, uh, I have a friend who sent her a birthday card this month. Um, not me, my cat. Yeah. And that's because awesome. she noted when, you know, like when people get their pets and, yeah. you know, and, and that's really sweet. Yeah. Um, and you know, that had quite an impression. So, you know, don't be afraid to have silly, what seems like silly buckets, you know, like fans of different sports teams or people who like, like you said, people who like beer, people who like burgers, yeah. um, you know, don't be afraid to have some silly, but meaningful and human segments. Yeah. And by having those segments that will also hopefully help you create content ideas too. Cause now you go, okay, I've got a content, a list of beer drinkers. Ah, now I can send them beer. Ah, I, I could send a funny cat meme that I, that I have or something. Yeah. And it helps you then create the content that way as well. Totally. So I started a new segment. I haven't even named it yet. I just asked Addo last time, but what is one book that you would recommend to our viewers if they were to read right now that would make a big difference in their business? I'm a huge book fan. So narrowing it down to one book is hard. I mean, I can be like, let me tell you about 10. Um, Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. 
maybe one of the best business related marketing books ever. Um, and I'm going to cheat and give you a second one. Okay. Um, this is marketing by Seth Godin. Yeah, he's like, fantastic. Really, really good. And both of them just break it down into really simple terms. Like, like again, like ideas of the hitchhiker and, you know, keeping those things in your mind. Um, so yeah, building a story brand and this is marketing. Awesome. Appreciate it. So what are the best ways for people to find out about you, what you're about and how can they connect with you? I'm super easy to find. So my website is ValerieGarcia.com and on social media everywhere, I'm Valerie Garcia. So okay, cool. yeah. So we'll I'm put that in the link. The one that's not the Filipino porn star. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing that. That's fine. That comes up first yes, every yes. time. So yeah. just not that one. Second okay. One. <laughs> click next. If your spouse is watching, just tell them you're clicking for you. So, okay. So we'll put that in the links and uh, we'll have our audience reach out and check out. And uh, we really appreciate being on the show. It was great content, great information. And I know it's going to, people are going to find that useful. So awesome. And nice to chat you. with you. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks. Thanks for checking out today's episode. If you'd like more videos like this, be sure to sub like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Facebook page and our other social media channels. Looking forward to bringing you more great content like this and happy farming. Happy farming.